Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome in Adam Goldberg today. Adam, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure of ours. We're super excited. If you didn't know, just a heads up to everybody out there. Today is National Pets Day. So happy National Pets Day to everybody out there. Uh, even if you don't have a pet, you could at least find one that perhaps you at least like. You don't have to love them, but you can <laughs> like them. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, Adam is going to be talking today about how to take better pet portraits in studio. So thanks for joining us. I want to give a quick thank you as well to our sponsor for this event, which is Westcott. So thank you very much for them. As well, everybody at home watching, thanks for joining us. If you do have any questions that you'd like to get answered by Adam, please feel free to submit them and you could do so on Zoom by using the Q&A tab. If you're joining us here on YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, any of our wonderful channels, go ahead and drop a comment in the comment section and we'll make sure to get them over to him as we can. But otherwise, Adam, thanks again for being here. I'm going to hand over the floor to you. All right. Well, Scott, thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it okay. Yes, sir. And I'm going to hit play. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for attending. I'm really excited to, to present to you. I've started my educational journey as of recently. I had never taught photography. Really, I never took a photography class. I kind of learned everything from watching videos online, honestly. Um, I am Adam Goldberg. I live in Tampa, Florida, and I run and own a pet photography studio, and I do that with my wife. But I'm going to share some of my journey, and then we're going to get into the meat of the presentation. And then uh, if Scott or you know sees any questions or if he has any questions, uh, feel free to chime in. So I wanted to show you this uh, for a reason, and this was one of the first pet photos I took where someone paid me to do it. This was in 2016. And what I used to do was what I call, or the industry calls shoot and burn uh, type of photography, where you take a bunch of photos in a short amount of time, you send them an online gallery and you let them pick their favorites and you know, that's it. And th you can get burnt out really quickly doing shoot and burn because you're charging a low cost and you're making, I don't know, a hundred bucks a pop, but the experience isn't there for the client. They have to pick out their photos on their own. But I want to show you this set of photos. This is a Boston Terrier. This is before I knew anything about lighting or backdrops or really anything about studio work from experience. It was all through YouTube. And you could see that, you know, you could see the floor in the photo. The dog, if you can look carefully, isn't really happy in these pictures. The dog isn't even looking at the camera in the majority of the, of the photos. But I wanted to show this because it's it's something that I would edit the dog out of the photo. Um, this is one of those photos. And I'll get to what I was saying before in a second about editing him out into a clean backdrop. But I'm not going to I'm not sure it translates through YouTube or through any of the other channels you might be watching on. But there's a lot of noise in this picture. So if you're familiar with ISO, ISO is a, a way to add extra light to your photography if you're you know have a high shutter speed like 2000 for example you need to increase your iso to make sure the image is bright enough for a proper exposure when you're using a low-end camera i was using a canon t6i at the time it was like introductory grade camera you're going to get a lot of noise a lot of grain in the picture so once you start to upgrade your camera what i use now is an r5 which is a mirrorless camera handles you know these high ISO settings or situations much better than that first camera that I had back in 2016. But I wanted to point this noise out because all my pictures had noise in it and there are ways to reduce noise in like Lightroom, but it, it kind of affects the sharpness. I can't really zoom in on this presentation, but you'll also see the catch lights. So the catch lights I like despise in this picture. I look back from a photo from that long ago and you can see like the different bulbs in the eye, the dog's not looking at the camera. It's just not an ideal photo. I'm not straight on, the backdrop stands in the back of the picture. Just a terrible, I mean, you know, you critique your own work. I, I, I consider this a terrible picture. So if you look closely, I cut out, when I was doing this um, part-time, I, I would cut out each dog and Photoshop it onto this background to get a clean background because the lens I was using uh, was too wide 
it wasn't um, the best lens. It was like an event photography lens. My tip, first tip of the day would be to use a 50 millimeter lens if you're on a full frame camera. If you're on a, um, a crop sensor camera, like um, you know the T6i, for example, you wanna use maybe a, a 35 millimeter because of that crop factor. The crop factor effectively makes your 35 millimeter a 50 millimeter, depending on your camera. But that focal length is great because what you can do if you're working by yourself, you can actually, within arm's reach, interact with the animal. Um, being able to give the animal treats, give the animal uh, love and affection or play with a toy, by having that 50, mid, excuse me, 50 millimeter focal length, you're able to interact with the pet yourself. Now, once you have an assistant, you can switch focal lengths. You can have a zoom lens and get farther back. Um, right now I use a 24 to 70, but I have an assistant, so I don't have to be as close um, to the pet. But when I look back at these, especially my wife, who's a graphic designer, just like gives me so much, uh, gr <laughs> so much, so much gruff uh, for this, because you could see how bad the clip job was. So Adam, I just want to jump in real quick and ask yeah. a question about that. Uh, you know, you're, you're very candid here, which we appreciate. That's always helpful to know, you know, obviously not everybody starts as a professional photographer, right? So you, you admit that this is, you know, you, you were doing this part-time. Were you, were you handholding everything or did you ever consider kind of putting it on a tripod and then using sort of like a shutter release, something like that to be able to interact with the animals a little bit easier? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've tried tripods and because the animals move around so much, it's impossible. Um, it's Cause I'm like bobbing and weaving and shifting to my left and right or moving back, trying to get the dog um, to stay in one spot is, is, can be very difficult. So being on a tripod usually doesn't work for me. Um, and the shutter release, you know, old school, you would have a wire and have to click it, but you can do it from your phone these days with Wi-Fi. In. But I, uh, it's not doable because the tripod's going to get in the way. I, if I have to get closer to the pet, it, it's just not ideal. Okay. Um, do they answer your question? Yeah, a hundred percent. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, this clip job is terrible, but I really didn't know what I was doing at the time. Um, I didn't really get into my story too much. If you want to research, I don't want to bore you. I want to get to the tips, but essentially I worked at an animal shelter, which is how I got started in all of this and fell in love with photography and taking photos of animals at the same time would watch videos on YouTube and go downstairs to the shelter and practice on so many different types of animals. I'm going to get to my love of shelter pet photography here in a little bit. So this is a photo. I don't know if you could really make it out, but this is a two light setup with a cheap, cheap, cheap $70 kit from Amazon. And unfortunately those kits are not meant to be taken down and set back up, taking down and set back up again. And it broke the umbrella rod went right through the cheap canvas of the softbox, And I was like, really, I was really, um, I'm trying not to curse on this. Can I curse or should I, maybe I shouldn't curse, but I was really annoyed that it broke. So I called the distributor and they're like, sorry, nothing we can do. So this was my very first setup. It did the trick. You could see that, um, backdrop also, I want to mention was a vinyl backdrop. I don't use vinyl anymore. It's too difficult to clean. Now I use backdrop paper. So I kind of just, once I'm done with it, I throw it away and it makes my job a lot easier. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. So then I switched to my second setup, um, which was Westcott. And Westcott has been an amazing partner. They actually donated a lighting kit to me in the animal shelter that I worked at. And that's how I became familiar with them. And then I moved to Tampa and didn't, and I was living in South Florida at the time, didn't have any money to dedicate to photography. I didn't know if I was going to stick with it or not. And 70 bucks seemed like a, a low enough uh, barrier to entry, but I decided to throw, I think these were like $500 and I bought these and it's so much higher quality. Um, this was a basics kit. You could see it in the screenshot here um, for beginners. And essentially I used, this was probably 2016 also, but used just light bulbs. Like you could, they, Westcott sells light bulbs, but they have LED lights now. And these were constant lights. I use strobe lights now, which I'll go over too. But constant lights, if you're just starting out, is a great um, entry point into pet photography because lighting can be very difficult to master and to learn. But if you have constant lights in your arsenal, which Westcott sells, they have the Solix line now, you will be a lot better off because you only have to focus on 
the pet, learning how to you know handle the pet versus handling the pet and figuring out the lighting at the same time. So this was two lights set up. Um, I don't think they sell this kit anymore. You could see in this picture um, a spoon. Uh, my wife, Mary, who was helping me uh, while she was working full time, we work full time together now, but she has a spoon full of peanut butter and you can almost see the peanut butter on this dog's mouth. Um, but this photo was in 2017. So that was my second studio setup. And then I graduated to this setup. Um, we used to travel the country, my wife and I, pre-COVID, doing events all around the country. So we were actually going to be in New York uh, in April of 2020. We were going to be doing photo shoots at the Google offices, um, doing events there, and it, that all got shut down. So we would take our setup. You could see this Pelican case, and we would pack this equipment in there. Again, these are um, constant lights. And it just made it a lot easier when I was in a public place. I would set up my studio in like a brewery or... Um, uh, you know, uh, mainly breweries, honestly, where they were pet friendly and they would allow us to set up in a corner. I'm a big craft beer fan. And there's always a, a corner that is not used. So we were able to set this up again, constant lights, but these are a much higher end unit from Westcott. Um, and these are constant lights still, but these, um, these made it a lot easier to capture uh, the animals on the road with a smaller setup. So you can see behind here, um, this was probably in 2019, I think this photo was taken, but it, we use a savage uh, universal backdrop paper um, and it, you know, it made it a lot easier versus having to clean a vinyl backdrop. You, you spend a little bit more money on it, but you kind of just cut it off at the bottom and then you're done. Okay, so fast forward to August of 2020, I opened my own studio in Tampa and this is fairly close to the setup I use now. Um, we use three strobe lights. Um, this was uh, before I switched to all FJ400s. Now I use three FJ400s. Those are the strobe lights. And the quality of the photo is just 10 times, if not 100 times better than a constant light photo because the power of the light is so much more powerful. And going back to my first point about ISO, you can have 100 ISO in a studio with strobe lights uh, if you're doing strobe photography. 100 ISO is very little noise. You're going to get the highest quality photo uh, from that. When you're using constant lights, your ISO has to be really high because your shutter speed has to be high to make sure you're capturing a moving animal in uh, with it being sharp. So if you're thinking like 200 shutter speed, that animal, if they're moving at all, is going to be blurry. With a strobe photography, if you're using, um, you know, the settings built in, we, I call it flash or excuse me, freeze mode that Westcott, use it, Westcott has, you could use a shutter speed of like 100 and get sharp focus photos. Unlike constant lights, if you had 100 shutter speed, you're, it's going to be all blurry if they move or if you move for that matter. So this is a quick look inside our current studio. We transitioned from the shoot and burn method. We were doing 300 clients a year. And we now do maybe 15 a month, or excuse me, 300 a month. And our busiest month was 300 a month, 10 minute photo shoots. But now we do maybe 10 to 15 a month um, and we do in-person sales. So what that means is people get to come to our studio and then they actually will get to see their photos in our uh, theater room and they make a purchase of artwork that we've helped them design for their home. Much better experience. So I wish someone had told me to not do shoot and burn sooner but as a new photographer, it's a common business practice to do that shoot and burn to get your feet wet. But I had wished that I had done, you know, in-person sales a little bit sooner. So Adam, I wanted to, I want to interrupt you and go back a, a, a couple slides previous. So I think there you go. We'll, we'll start here. So it, it, it looks like you've got the, the Westcott basics, which I'm assuming was just like a single fixture, constant light. And then it looks like you upgraded to what I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but those look like the TD six is the spider light TD six. Correct. Yep. Um, look at me. Look, it's almost, it's almost <laughs> like I've seen this stuff before. <laughs> and then, and then now you jumped into the FJ 400, you know, what, what advice would you give to somebody who's that beginner photographer, you know, there's such a heavy emphasis on gear and what the right gear is and what to get and what to have. And budgets obviously are always a limitation, especially if you're maybe venturing into this and not sure if you're going to pursue it full time or not. You know, do you recommend still maybe trying something, maybe not like the basics kit, but going with something like a, a TD6, the Spider Light, which, like we said, you know, they don't really make that anymore. Or do you say, you know, 
try to invest in something like an FJ 200, which is a step down from the 400, it's 200 watt seconds versus the 400 watt seconds and just try to make that extra little budget kind of amendment so that you have that kind of in the bag? Yeah, that's a great question. So looking back at my history, I, I kind of skipped a genre of lights. So this was the TD5, which had five bulbs. Um, and you can control them separately. So there's three switches that control two lights at a time. Good eye on the eagle eye, Scott. Um, the TD6, believe it or not, um, West Scott, I have a quick funny story. I'm a big Shark Tank fan. My um, TD5s weren't really cutting it anymore. I was watching Shark Tank. They would say, hey, how did you get the attention of Whole Foods to get your um, you know, food in Whole Foods? And they're like, oh, I just called them. And they're, the sharks are like applauding them. And they're like, oh, you're like the only entrepreneur that, you know, makes the effort. This was five years ago. So I called Westcott, honestly, and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. I do these adaption photos. I do these fundraising events. Do you have any equipment that you could lend me so I can step my game up? Someone answered the phone right away. I don't know if you're familiar with Westcott's customer service, but it's amazing. You get a human on the phone. Um, they're headquartered in Ohio. And they sent these to me um, for free honestly. And it was like the biggest, I was telling everyone, I, um, don't call Westcott for free gear. Now they probably hate me for saying that, but they sent it to me and it, it honestly was such a win for me as like a business person and entrepreneur. I felt, cause these were like six or $700 and I didn't have that money at the time. And it really jump started my photography career. So to answer your question, I know I kind of rambled, but Westcott does have the FJ 200. I'm not sure of the price point. I have used it for indoor photography. It's powerful enough for sure. We're talking about studio photography. If you're going to be doing outdoor photography where you're trying to overpower the sun, I would go with the FJ 400. Um, we've done some outdoor photography. If you're in the middle of the day, which strobe photography is great for also, um, go with the FJ 400 if you can afford it. Or um, there's a great Westcott community group. I know that um, there's a lot of tips and tricks in there as well, but if you're just looking to start out and you want to start with constant lights, because you don't want to have to worry about the lights, what you see is what you get. I would go with the Solix light system. Um, they have the Solix bicolor. I, I skipped that in my presentation by mistake, but that is an LED versus a you know traditional bulb uh, type light like you're seeing here. But it lets you dial it up to 100. You could dial it down to zero and do different uh, white balance temperatures. So I would recommend that for someone just starting out. And then they're great for video. So if you dabble in any sort of video, those are great. We actually still use those to this day. There are times where dogs are scared of the flash. So I bring those Solex lights out just in case we need them. I don't prefer to use them. I don't have to, but I do have them uh, just in case. So if you start with the Solex, you can graduate to the FJ400 once you're comfortable with lighting, but that would be my tip. Uh, and again, no, I rambled, but I, that hopefully. Yeah. Answered your question. No, no, that was great. Okay. So this is my current, uh, setup, much bigger space. Um, I love, you know, the light that you get from Westcott lights. I've, it, I've used another brand. I'm not gonna, I didn't really enjoy the, the light quality was terrible. Um, so I want to transition to what we do and how I got started. Truthfully, I was taking adoption photos and, this is my setup for adoption photos today. We partner with the Humane Society of Tampa Bay. We roll the backdrop out. Again, this is Savage Universal Paper. And up until recently, I was using this setup with the three light setup. So the two lights in the back are used as rim lights, which I'll show you what that looks like. And then on the right is a seven foot uh, silver shoot through umbrella with diffusion on it. And that gives that key light, that main light, with it being such a big light source, gives you a beautiful soft light. I think a lot of photographers that I see, you know, I look on Instagram and they're using very small modifiers and it, the lighting just looks, doesn't look soft. It doesn't look real. It looks um, very artificial. So with my style, not that there's anything wrong with that, but my style, I want it to be very, look very natural. I, I obsess over lighting. Uh, my wife would tell you I, when I first started in our living room, I was trying so many different lighting techniques and call it a recipe, but I finally honed in on our style. And then this is like a behind the scenes. I have actually since eliminated these lights behind, and I'll tell you why. This is a shelter. This is a shelter dog. Shelter animals can be a little skittish. 
And I'm actually using an Okta M in this particular photo, but I have since switched. An Okta M is a Westcott product. It is 36 inches, but I love the look of the seven foot umbrella a lot more. So I switched. But these lights, uh, excuse me, these lights, when they're behind you, right, they're going to be behind you, they emit a, a sound and the light flashes and it would freak the dogs out. And one day I just decided not to bring them and noticed a huge difference, at least for these shelter animals, that when you have these lights for something they can't see, it made them a lot more comfortable. So I have since eliminated the, the rim lighting here, but in our studio, we do, do use the rim lighting. You'll also see these grids on here. These grids, I think it's a 40 degree egg crate is what they're called. It's a Westcott product as well. And they focus the light so that it hits the side of the animal properly versus coming back into my camera and washing out the image. It also um, it really gives a direct beam of light. If that wasn't on there, the light would spread uh, a lot farther. So these are our shelter photos. These are the photos from today. Um, and you can see a big difference from that first photo I showed you. The sharpness, the quality of light is a lot better. Um, the photo in the middle, you could see the rim lights on the right and the left. It looks like the, if you're looking at the dog, the dog's right. If you're looking at the photo in the middle, the light might be a little too bright, might be a little too hot on this animal. Um, but my goal is to help people visualize what it could be to have this pet in their home. And this is again, how I got started. Uh, I won't bore you with that whole story, but really this is my passion is helping shelter animals find homes. The photos that are on the Humane Society's website, unfortunately, are not that great. So I wanted to show you a before and after. So let's top left, um, unless we're mirrored, but it's this um, gray dog, this pit bull um, dog. The photo on the left is the photo that they get when it comes in, they're taking it with an iPad and it's scared and nervous. And they're onto the next dog very quickly because they get a lot of animals that come in. The photo on the right is our photo. And you could just see a big difference. Um, Scott, when you look at these shelter photos, if you don't mind me asking, what uh, emotion do you get from them? Um, if you're just thinking about the shelter taken photo that the shelter takes themselves. They just look sad. They look yeah. really, really sad and, and kind of you know nervous to be there. Yeah, absolutely. So these are the photos that end up on the website, unfortunately. So once a month we go in and do these shelter kind of makeover photos. And it's such a big difference. It gets a huge play on social media, as you can imagine, where we show the before and after. And we have countless stories of people seeing the photos online and then going to adopt um, right after. So it's a big passion for us. And one of the one of the questions we got here from Luke, and he wants to know why did you choose that color background? I'm kind of also curious on that end. Did you choose? And and this is just a a guess on my end. Is that something to do with like red being a correlation between like certain feelings or something like that? Or was that that just the color that was like we're gonna go with red? Yeah, it's a good question, and I do get this question a lot. Um, so thanks. It was a Luke that asked. Thank you, Luke. Um, so we used to before we switched colors at all we would get a lot of questions on our social media about if this dog was adoptable because we would always use gray. That was like my signature color um, to create a brand. It was really focused on creating a brand where anyone could recognize my photo based on this gray backdrop and the lighting style. And then I got tired of answering those questions on Instagram. So I changed it to blue, blue backdrop. And the tagline was, if it's blue, this dog could be for you. So it was like a blue jean from Savage. And then Last or two years ago, the Bucks were in the Super Bowl and it was like Valentine's Day. So I was like, let's switch it up. Let's do red. The shelter's color also happens to be red. Excuse me. Their logo is red. And when we posted the red photos, got so many compliments on them. So that's the reason is that the Bucks were in the Super Bowl. It was Valentine's Day. And then we got a lot of compliments on it. I know a lot of people say like red is um like kind of what you were alluding to which is like brings a certain emotion or like a danger or like something's wrong but um it just went well with the shelter's branding and kind of stuck with it based on compliments okay so i'm I, I'm, I'm not going to fault you for it and i don't want to deviate too far but but that means you're a tom brady fan i guess <laughs> you know um i guess <laughs> ah, i guess so i was <laughs> i guess so without getting too into it i guess so and then he retired and came back so it's um it's all good there um, I guess, are you a Jets or a Giants fan? 
I'll, 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 I'll plead the fifth. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, moving on, but good question. Um, so now in addition to a gray for our studio and we also offer white, it's become actually my favorite for a few reasons, white, and you'll see the seven foot umbrella here. When you're photographing a lot of dogs at once, or you're photographing a family and we'll go, get into that, it's a lot easier to get them evenly lit on a white backdrop. When we're working with gray, it's good for like one or two dogs or a person and a dog. But I like the gray with a smaller modifier. So if I'm using gray, I'll use a 36 inch softbox, the Octa M. If we're using white, I'll use this um, seven foot umbrella and it's off to the side and like a Rembrandt position. If you're not familiar with what a Rembrandt position is, it's a very common uh, lighting positioning where it's actually kind of what's happening from this window that I'm kind of sitting diagonally from is that it's not gonna be that dramatic, but there's gonna be like a triangle right here um, on my face and it creates a flattering lighting pattern. So I always like to have it um, to the to the right or to the left versus straight on. Um, and what you get out of it is a photo like this. So in this particular photo, this dog's name is Elvis. Elvis, the light was on Elvis's left, or excuse me, uh, his right, if you're uh, looking at him. So coming in again, I'm not sure if we're mirrored, but it's, you can see where it's brighter along his body. And then it's a little more shadowed to create a more of a dynamic lighting pattern. And then something to look at on this photo is in my five tips. If you watch that is the catch lights, catch lights. I obsess over those two. Um, the catch lights are the little round light that you can see in the eye of the, of the pet. And if you don't have those, you know, the, the photo has like a, we call it dead eye, but just does it doesn't come alive unlike this picture it's one of this is one of our more famous photos um and what i also wanted to mention was this is a doodle if you know anything about dog breeds doodles tend to have longer eyebrows um brandon from westcott just posted his doodle and you can't see uh if you go on i don't know if it made it to westcott's page or not but you couldn't see the dog's eyes at all and because the dog has long fur so when you're photographing a doodle try and brush their head back or a schnauzer for that matter. The schnauzer was on my first slide when I first started, but that's another tip. If you're having a long haired dog, try and brush the hair out of that dog's eye because you want that catch light. Otherwise it's not gonna be there. So this particular photo um, was for golden retrievers. They were very well behaved. Things I'm seeing now that I look at the photo again, you can see the, the rim lights on either side. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you're photographing um, a bunch of dogs together or even one dog is your f-stop. So if you have a shallow depth of field like an f2.8 or a, a f4, because dogs have longer noses, again, I shared this in my five tips, but dogs have longer noses. So you should always be trying to focus on the eye. Um, even with human photography, you want to try and focus on the eye, but their humans tend to have flatter faces than dogs do. So if you have a shallow depth of field, like a 2.8, you're going to get the eye in focus, but the nose is going to be out of focus, especially with dogs that you're photographing uh, multiple at a time. You'll notice that they're all in the same plane or the same level. If, you know, the dogs in the middle were a little farther back, the dogs on the sides were farther forward, someone's going to be out of focus. So we're always trying to make sure that they're on the same, same level. Um, that's a big tip that we, that I have. And then I want to point out also that, um, actually I forgot what I was going to say, but the, so what I'm shooting at is F8 or F9, maybe sometimes F10 to get everything in focus properly. So in addition to photos of, you know, pets by themselves, a lot of what we do now, which we didn't used to do before, before COVID and before we had our studio, we would take photos of just pets by themselves. And now we take photos of um, pets and their family members. And what a lot of people, when they see us online and they Google like pet photography near me, or they think they want a pet photo and people have a, uh, an assumption about what pet photography is. They think it's something you can get at PetSmart for $10 or it's like photos with Santa. And for us, it's like kind of the opposite of that. It's a luxury experience. It's something that we take a lot of time to learn about the animals that we're photographing, which allows us to get photos like this. So my next point is don't put yourself under a time limit. We used to do 10 minute photo shoots and that was it. And there was a lot of pressure on the dog. There's a lot of pressure on the owner. 
now that we have our own studio, we don't have any time limit at all. We only take one client per day. So this dog, if you know anything about dog behavior, if they're on their back, it means they're comfortable. It means they're comfortable in their environment because otherwise, if they're not on their back and they're not comfortable being there, it means they're scared of a predator. So if you've ever seen a dog fall asleep on their back, it means they're comfortable because if you're in the wild and you're a dog, you're not sleeping on your back because you have to be ready to run at a moment's notice if you know there's a coyote in the distance, if that makes sense. So the point with this photo is that we're able to capture these emotions, capture these moments. We'd like to say it's a celebration of you know, what you love about your, your furry animal. And it's again, the opposite of what most people think. It's not cute outfits. It's not, um, you know, photos of Santa. It's something that you're going to have forever. We get a lot of pets that are older that, um, you know, may have been diagnosed with an illness or something that their family wants to remember them for forever. So always try and put out there that it's a luxury experience. Um, it's a quick this, question here because you mentioned about in, in the past that you used to do the 10 minute shoots and, and provide photos. Um, now you're taking on less clients during the day, focused a little bit more. Mark was asking, and I think maybe he, he misunderstood and had asked how many photos do you provide in the 10 minute shoot? But I think, I think the, the question really goes to how many photos are you kind of give, getting out right now in, in the current state of how you operate? Yeah. I mean, I can answer both. So in a 10 minute photo shoot, when we were using constant lights, I was on burst mode. I had a Canon one DX. I was taking 500 photos and within 10 minutes. Um, and then I would provide maybe 30 to 40 for them to review, but a lot of them are similar in that 10 minute photo shoot because you're not, you don't have enough time to get variety. Um, and usually the photos honestly look like this, that were chest up. Um, the reason I I'll get to why I chose this photo in a second, but now we're still taking three to 400 photos over two hours. And we're usually showing the client maybe 10% of those. So maybe 30 to 40 as well. So it's taking maybe 90 minutes, two hours to get the same amount of photos, but they're a lot different and there's more variety, which is the same thing. And they're just a lot more meaningful. It's not the same photo that everybody's going to get that photo with um, this is this particular photo is unique to this woman and her dog. Like this is something they do. And we learned that on a phone call pre photo shoot. So it was really important for her to capture this interaction. Um, we tell our clients that we just want you to interact with your dog and we're just going to be there to take a photo of it. We're not going to tell you to like sit there and smile for the most part, maybe in the beginning, but it's really celebrating the love you have for your pet. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So, um, and if you have a follow-up question uh, to that, to the comment or just write it back another question. But so this photo, this was not using any sort of um, fast sync speed on my light. Um, Westcott, the FJ400 has a freeze mode, which allows you to essentially change the light output. So, and if you think it's kind of difficult to explain without having the, the light with me, but essentially if you didn't have it on freeze mode, the light would just spread and doesn't let you necessarily freeze action on a low shutter speed. The freeze mode changes the light output from the strobe and cuts it off abruptly, which is what freezes the action. So you're not relying on shutter speed. So if you look closely, this dog is giving a high five, the paw is out of focus. And that's, I wanted to use this as an example. There's some sort of motion here. My shutter speed wasn't set properly and the dog's face wasn't moving. So that's in sharp focus, but the paw was. Now, if you know the rules, you know how to break them. Maybe you want to show the paw in motion, in action, and maybe you don't. Maybe you want it to be sharp focus. So we'll, we work with large uh, pet food companies for packaging, and they want something very specific. So we did one recently where we did photos for pet food packaging, and they needed a very specific pose, and they wanted everything in sharp focus. Um, but this is one of my photos for our Instagram or for a client. Maybe I wanted that action to show. So it's just knowing what it is that you're trying to get and how to achieve it is, is the lesson here. And this photo um, just brings me joy because we do photograph cats and cats can be very uh, challenging, but usually in our experience, they steal the show when it comes to the session. So usually a, a pet parent will book a photo shoot for their dog and they're like, oh, maybe I'll bring my cat and maybe we'll get a good photo. But if not, it's no big deal. I don't have high expectations. 
But usually the cats end up stealing the show because cats have a lot more personality than dogs. They can jump off the ground. They swat at things. But these two particular animals are related in the sense that they share a household. And at home, they interact with their owner, or excuse me, they interact with each other all the time. So it was really important for the owner to capture them together. Um, it got cut off here, but they're, um, you know, holding paws. I may have been in a different photo that I didn't include, but I do have a photo of them holding paws as well. But um, when it cats, there's a video on my YouTube channel about how to do cat photography. Uh, maybe that might be a different uh, video with BNH someday, but it's uh, cats are, are just as interesting to photograph as dogs. Now, just because we're, we're getting a lot of questions, I know you talked a little bit about this in the beginning. Um, we might have had some people who joined us a little bit late, but we are getting a lot of questions about it. So I think it's worth addressing again. Sure, um, sure. People are asking, what is your go-to lens choice for today? Yeah, so today I use the Canon RF 24 to 70. Um, I'm using it right now for this video, otherwise I'd show it to you, but it allows me to stay in one spot so I can achieve that 50 millimeter focal length if I want to interact with the pet myself. So if you joined late, my tip from before was 50 millimeter um, if you have a full frame or a 35 millimeter crop sensor camera. But today I, I use um, a zoom lens, the 24 to 70. It's super fast focusing mechanism. It's a little, you know, on the costly side, but very, you know, worth it. I almost never take it off my camera. Um, and then sometimes I'll use a 70 to 200 in the studio if the dog doesn't like me, um, which is rare. I mean, who doesn't, you know, can you imagine someone not, or a pet not liking me? But it does happen. Sometimes animals that have been abused by a man or don't like beards, for example, they don't like me being close or some animals get scared of the camera. So having a, a shorter focal length, you know, is a hindrance in that regard, but then I'll use a zoom lens like the 70 to 200, which lets me get far, lets me get farther back. And usually that creates a, a big enough barrier between me and the pet where they're comfortable. Sure. And, and just to clarify, just because there are different versions, are you shooting the 24, 70, 2, 8 or the F4? Yes. Good question. So I'm using the F4. Um, I didn't feel the need. There's a whole debate on whether or not you need to go as low as a camera needs. I'm not shooting at 2.8 hardly ever. I think I'm using 2.8 now for this, but I never use it, <laughs> never use it for anything else. So the F4 suit my needs. F2 is, uh, I don't know if you know, pricing Scott is a lot higher than the, than the four. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. If you're doing like outdoor photography and you're like, love the bokeh or the bokeh, however you pronounce it. And you want <laughs> that like smooth out of focus background. And you're like obsessed over that. There's tons of videos on YouTube that compare the two and you want to spend the extra money. But if you're just starting out, I think the F4 is great. If you're really just starting out, I would get a 50 millimeter lens. The F 1.4, 1.8, I think is a hundred bucks, right? Um, Scott, I'm not sure. I think, but it's fairly inexpensive. Um, so if you're just starting out, you, you could do the, you know, a crop sensor in a 35 millimeter or, you know, like a Canon R, I think, or an RP less than a thousand. And then, uh, you know, 50 millimeter lens is less than a hundred, maybe less than 200, I think. Uh, but don't quote me, but th that's the, kind of the cheapest way to get, get in the game awesome. from a camera standpoint. Um, but good question. Okay. So yeah. this, um, this photo is of a puppy, uh, bulldog. I just love the interaction that they're having this dog. Now that I look closely is looking slightly off camera and one of my assistants. Um, but I just thought it was a, a great photo from a lighting standpoint. So I'm going to, can't move my little bar, but, um, the light in the dog's eyes is good. The catch light is there. The catch light in the woman's face is there. Um, it's just a, a beautifully lit photo. That's why I wanted to show this. You could see the rim light, um, on her hand and the, it's very subtle. Um, but if it wasn't there, you would notice it. If I took the same picture without it, uh, you would definitely notice it, that it, that it's there, but I just, I love the lighting on this picture. Um, and we, again, this is a, a group of three dogs. I kind of did an upward hero shot for this one. Um, you can see the catch lights again, very important. Um, the light. I believe is on their right. So if you're, if you're the dog, it's going to be on the right hand side at a 45 degree angle, um, angled down. And it just creates a beautiful lighting pattern. And the light also hits the backdrop as well. So my style is I'm trying to light the animal and the backdrop at the same time. There's ways to do it where you pull the animals away from the backdrop 
light the backdrop separately than the subject. So if you've ever done product photography and you're trying to get a clean white background, you know, that's a way to do it. Light the backdrop separately, blast light at it. But I like to light the animal and the pet, or excuse me, the animals and the backdrop at the same time. Uh, so that's the example in this picture. Um, again, this one is just showing the joy and emotion that we're trying to capture uh, between human and, and animal. And it's, you probably haven't seen a photo like this very often from a pet photo studio. Usually it's straight on headshot. It's what we used to do for many years, but by having no time limit, letting the dogs get comfortable, um, the, you know, the owner here has his fingers in the dog's mouth. It's something they do constantly just to mess around. And it just created such a engaging photo in my opinion. And this is the one they purchased among others. And it just, really shows how far I've come from a photography standpoint that getting a dog to be this comfortable without having a time limit and having the owner really enjoy it, especially the man. Usually it's the female that is reaching out to us for photos and the husband's like, Ugh, photos of my dog. Great. And then they get there and then they have this amazing time. Um, but they, they assume it's going to be bad and they assume it's going to be photos with Santa kind of thing. And it's not, at least in our studio, it's not. Now, one one question that did come across, and I, I bring it up because you 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 sort of mentioned it in a previous comment about you know something that the owner does, and then in that last photo you knew that that was something that the owner does with with their dog as well. Uh, Mark wanted to know from YouTube what sort of questions do you ask your clients at the pre shoot meeting in order to kind of get that information and know what to sort of expect walking into that shoot. Yeah, that's a great question. It's um kind of a long answer. I'm going to try and keep it short. We, if you go to our website, all over the website, it says book a discovery call and the discovery call, you have to book that to have a shoot with us. A lot of people think like, Oh, how much does it cost? When can I come in? How far are you booking out? Okay. See you next Tuesday. And it's not like that at all. I'd say we get, we book in a third of our inquiries because not everybody's our client based on how we run our studio and the pricing associated with it to answer their question everybody has a discovery call and we have a really well thought out process on how we learn about the animals and the pets and their owners and their interactions. So for example, this guy's name was Javier. And we had a conversation with Javier about, you know, what is it like when he gets home from her work and what's the interaction like when you get home? And it's similar to this. He's like, Oh, I just get home. I sit on the floor with them and we just get to relax and that's my favorite part of my day. And then I say, well, okay, well, if we were able to capture that for you, what would that mean to you? And that's usually the best question to ask because it's bringing an emotional experience, a, a beautiful emotional experience to the photo shoot. And it's less about checking a box. Like my dog's getting older. I need photos done, or I got a puppy. I need photos done. It's how can I celebrate what I love about my pets and have that in a photograph? So everyone books a discovery call and we kind of use a practice called active listening where we ask a question and let them, the client talk about it. And we just ask questions based on what they've just said versus like, okay, what breed is your dog? What size are they? How old are they? What color are they? We don't have a checklist of questions. We just kind of let the conversation go. And then we talk about, you know, how they would like to enjoy their photos in their home. And then we make a recommendation, uh, you know, from artwork that we offer based on, you know, we have collections that are pre-fit that we sell to our clients. But it's um, that discovery call is so important. You can't just call, have people call you and say, okay, I'm available next Tuesday. And then they come in and you don't know anything about them. Yeah, you don't get photos like this from that. Um, but that was a great question. Um, same thing here. Like the, the dog, the white dog is a puppy. The um, dog on the right, the brindle dog is a older dog, as you can probably tell. And a lot of families, a lot of our ideal clients, a lot of them don't have children and their pets are their children. So being able to capture these moments that they have with them, the dog on the, the white dog is a puppy, that dog's gonna get huge. And this dog is not gonna be able to sit in this woman's lap for very long. So she really wanted to capture her dog as a puppy. A lot of people who have older dogs say, man, I wish I had known you when my dog was young. So we'll get, uh, you know, now that we've been in business since 2016, some dogs unfortunately passed away and we'll get them coming back because they had such a great experience. Even when we were doing those 10 minute photo shoots, 
And now they get like a really great experience from, you know, what we do now, which is, a, you know, no time limit, et cetera. So it's just a much better experience uh, for everyone involved. The dogs too, because they're so much more comfortable. When your dog is comfortable that you're photographing or cat or for that matter, you're gonna get a lot better photos for sure. Um, same here, if you've ever, you know, met a Weimariner, they can be very difficult. They need a lot of time to calm down. Um, this gentleman loves this dog. Same thing, sits on the floor with him when he gets home from work. And you could just see how he's looking at this dog um, with admiration. And it, um, it was just really special to him uh, to have that captured now that he's getting older too. Um, and you could just see the, the joy in these pictures as well. Again, I, I might be repeating myself, but without having a time limit, without um, with having those discovery calls, like I mentioned, that's how you're able to get photos like this versus um, you know, a quick photo shoot. Uh, I, when I look back at what we did before, I was like, how did we do that? How did, why did people wanna buy those pictures? Um, these are just so much better. Again, same here, just the emotion that we're able to capture with um, pet and their owner uh, as well. Um, now I wanna transition a little bit to, you know, these fast action photos. You see them everywhere now. I certainly didn't invent them. Um, but this particular photo, I believe I used the freeze mode on the FJ400. I don't have the camera settings in front of me, but I would guess it was at hundred shutter speed. The lights were on freeze mode at maybe half power. And with that, you're able to use burst mode on your camera and you don't have to worry about the, the FJ400 like recycling. Cause if you had it on like power nine, which is the highest, you're not gonna be able to take photos very quickly because it has to recycle and, and regain its power. But when you're at half power enabled by the freeze mode, you're able to capture action photos again with a low shutter speed and, and be in sharp focus. Um, this photo is a little cut off, but you can you get the, get the idea. Um, same here with the freeze mode. We used this set of three dogs. This was not Photoshopped. They were fighting over a bully stick. They're known to do that. Uh, we learned about that during their discovery call. And we were able to capture this with that freeze mode on a very low shutter speed. And uh, this is a client or the, a photo that the client had purchased as well. Talking uh, about that freeze mode, uh, we did get a question from Frenda over here who's joined us on Vimeo. And uh, they wanted to know, can they use the freeze mode on the FJ400 and still be able to change their shutter speed to higher than one two fiftieth of a second? Yeah, so you might be thinking about high speed sync. So high speed sync, and freeze mode are, are two different things. It's, they're kind of competing ideas. So you certainly can, to my knowledge, um, I don't need to go that high. That would kind of defeat the purpose of um, freeze mode, I think, if I'm understanding correctly. So high-speed sync is a function that allows your camera, depending on the brand that you have, to go over the sync speed. So for Canon, I believe, or at least the Canon I have, two, R5 is 250th. So if you did, if you had high speed sync off, you wouldn't be able to exceed one two fiftieth of a second. When you have a high speed sync on, you are able to go upwards above and capture action by using the shutter speed. So when you have a fast shutter speed, you're able to capture action as well. The freeze mode allows you to, you can, I believe you can go above what, you know, your flash sync speed, but you don't need to, um, to capture the action. So if you're trying to capture like a dog running at you, I think like this one, for example, I threw a, <clears throat> threw a tennis ball, the, the eyes are in focus, this dog is in action. The shutter speed was at hundred, the freeze mode was on. If I wanted to capture this same photo with like a shutter speed and high speed sync instead, remember that freeze mode and high speed sync are, are kind of competing, um, you know, methodologies, but I could have accomplished this with a 2000 shutter speed and a high ISO and maybe an F8 or an F6. But with freeze mode, you can be at like F8 or F9 and a shutter speed of hundred and maybe a slightly higher ISO as well. Um, so again, freeze mode and high speed sync are two different kind of theories. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Same here, like this is a, a Chinese crested that are known for their long hair. I think I used uh, shutter speed for this. And the, the quality is a little degraded. I think I pulled this from Facebook just to have easy access to it. But the, the, the high quality photo, the eyes are in focus, the nose are in focus, and the hair is slightly out of focus. 
which tells me I had maybe a shallower depth of field, maybe a 5.6 on this photo. Um, so, the, and I'm shooting at an angle. So the eye, I'm pointing it like you can, you guys can see me, but the eye is in focus, but the dog was kind of doing like a Fabio type thing. Um, and then we have about 10 minutes left. So I want to leave time for questions as well. I know we've had some along the way, but I'm, we're almost through here, but um, this was a shutter speed type fast action photo. Um, so then I had to lower my f-stop to maybe 5.6, but then the sacrifices, the whole photo isn't sharp and some of it's going to be out of focus because it's behind the focal point. And then, yes, this is the, oh, I have one more slide and then I go over the gear that I use, but this is a pug, one of my favorite photos. We call it the smug pug. <laughs> it just has such a smug look on it, look on him. And pugs, unlike a lab or a doodle, have very flat faces. So you can get away with maybe that shallower depth of field. Um, and then you'll notice here, the background is black. And then this is another technique, but I use, um, I pull the dog away from the backdrop so that when I light him, the light doesn't hit the backdrop. Excuse me, one moment. The light doesn't hit the backdrop. So then it turns to black. And then I can turn a white backdrop into black. I can turn a, a gray backdrop into black. It's just, uh, setting your camera in a way that the shutter speed is high enough the, to eliminate any sort of ambient light that comes in. So if you take a picture without your light on, you want that picture to have no outside light coming in. So then all that's being lit is your subject. And then the light isn't close enough to the backdrop to hit it, and then it turns to black. So behind this dog was actually a white backdrop, if you can believe it. And then you'll notice that there's rim lights, um, those like grid graded lights I showed you, and I'll show you again in the next slide, um, separating the dog from the backdrop, which is great in my three light setup. That's really what it's meant to do. Those rim lights is to separate the subject from the backdrop. And then finally, this is the gear that I use. Um, I know we talked about lenses. This is what I use today. So the R5, R5 and R6 have animal eye focus. I know there's a lot of other brands that do the animal eye focus. I rely on that heavily if you're not familiar. You can set your camera to have a, a focus point to automatically uh, land on the dog's eye or a cat's eye for that matter. And it's super helpful, especially for action shots. The camera just picks the focal point based on the, on the pet's eye and it makes a big difference for me. Um, I use the Canon RF 24 to 70 we talked about, um, the FJ 400, which is at the bottom, the Westcott Octa M, which is to the right of that um, FJ 400. The seven foot umbrella, which I use um, when we're using white to fill and make it like a, not necessarily pure white, but to fill the backdrop. And then it's a silver interior. Westcott makes a white interior as well, but it's a silver interior that makes the photos a little more punchy, um, specular highlights as well. Uh, so it just brings out a, a different quality of light. And then again, savage backdrop paper. I use thunder gray and I use pure white and then uh, primary red for the adaption photos. So this is kind of what's in my kit. Um, but that is my whole presentation. I wasn't sure how long it was going to last, but I, if there's any more questions, I'd love to answer them. Definitely. We definitely have more questions to get over to you. First question I want to start off with before we get on to all the questions that are being asked in the chat and everything. Uh, selfless plug, where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. So on a, uh, Instagram mainly and Facebook. So Instagram is probably where we live the most. There's a lot of behind the scenes content on there. So if you go through our reels, um, you'll be there. You'll be able to see that our Instagram is a gold photo, um, a gold photo on Instagram. Awesome. And so that's, that's primary Instagram, hit them up on Instagram, give them a follow, check out his stuff. Uh, now we'll, now we'll jump into some of the questions we've got from our audience over here. Terrence wants to know, great question. Would you recommend a mirrorless camera or a digital camera? Does it even really matter? Yeah, I don't think I'm, you know, I have used uh, DSLRs and I just switched to mirrorless. I, I'm one of those people that needs to have the best and the, and the, you know, the newest, um, mainly because I want to set myself apart from all these other photographers. Honestly, the R5 is pretty costly. It's like $3,500, I think, maybe more, somewhere around there. Um, you don't need that by any means. Um, if you're professional and you're earning money from your work and you can justify the purchase, then, then go ahead. Um, I had bought a Canon 1DX before this, 
The shutter speed was great. I was doing a lot of outdoor photos with dogs running at the camera. It's great for, you know, you see a lot of sports shooters using that. Um, but for mirrorless, you know, I, I don't know if I, I think the animal eye focus is really the advantage um, to me. And I, I'm not versed in, you know, enough in what can, and, or excuse me, what um, other brands have it. I think Sony has it. I'm, you know, Scott, you may know, I'm not sure, but the animal eye focus has been amazing. It makes my job so much easier. Um, I don't think you need a mirrorless if you're just starting out, if you can afford it and you're making money from your photography or you plan to, then I, I would do it. Awesome. And, and, and Dave just wants to know, because we've got to ask why, why the R5 over the R6? So I have both. Um, so <laughs> the R6, this is a good lesson. Actually, I used to have just one camera body and I was traveling the country. Um, and I dropped my one DX, um, and it stopped working in the middle of an event. And it was like eight o'clock at night. I had an event the next morning, Best Buy. I called like three Best Buys. They stayed open late for me. And I was able to, this was in Colorado. I was able to buy one. Um, but you always want to have a second camera body uh, on you just in case. So I didn't need two R5s. I didn't necessarily want to spend double the amount, but the R6 I do have. Um, the reason I got the R5 is because it can do AK video. Um, the R6 cannot. Um, so I wanted to future proof myself if I was spending that much money. Um, I try to get into video. I don't really have time to do it. So if you're, if you're into video and you have a computer that can handle the video, like the new M1 Max, they can certainly handle 8K video. But that was the reason initially. And then um, the animal eye focus for sure out of the, the um, mirrorless series. Awesome. And, and obviously for those wondering, Adam was going to go to Best Buy, but he, he needed it that day. So just, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Right. I wasn't uh, able to get it. If I was in New York, I would have run to BNH for sure. But, exactly. Uh, exactly. Good clarification. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. I'm here to help. Now yeah. Lane, Lane wants to know, uh, I said, I noticed in the one image with the multiple dogs that they were shot halfway up their bodies. Uh, they were also taught never to cut off their limbs. Do you just do what you're comfortable with? So it's a good question. I, it's not cut off. Um, if you're still seeing my screen, I just had to cut it off for this photo, uh, for the presentation. But I normally, if I am going to cut it off, if I'm sitting up close, like this one, um, this one's cut off like at the, at the wrist almost. Um, so I, I do, I do do it strategically and I do it at a, a place where it makes sense. You don't want to do it at a joint. Um, in my, from my standpoint, I was, when I would watch videos, when I was first starting out, that was like the rule. If you know the rule, you can break it. Right. So this photo, I, I didn't necessarily film the whole body and mainly, um, is cause it was on a platform and it was sitting on something that wasn't very photogenic. So I, um, I just cut it off because I didn't want to have to edit it out later. Awesome. Now, Chris on Vimeo wants to know, you're using three Westcott FJ 400s. Uh, what power are you using in terms of your settings on that relative to each light? Yeah. So let me see if I can find a good example photo. So let's look at this photo. Um, the key light would probably be at eight and a half. And then see how the lights, or maybe eight, um, and it goes to nine. And then, cause I wanna make sure the, the dogs are exposed properly, but I wanna make sure the light is hitting the backdrop, like I said before. So the, the rim lights, I'd probably put it at eight and a half. So that way they are a little bit powerful than the key light. That way you can see the difference in light. If they were all the same, or if the key lights, excuse me, if the rim lights were lower, you wouldn't see this here, it'd be dark. So that's um, usually eight, for the key light, eight and a half um, for the rim lights. Awesome, wonderful. Well, Adam, that's that's what we've got. We've got all the questions answered, which is wonderful. You did a wonderful job getting all of them out of the way. Uh, really, thank you so much for sharing your tips and and just tricks of of the trade, so to speak. I uh, want to give a huge thanks to our sponsors over at Westcott for sponsoring this event. Um, I know I know that there were some questions about the, the freeze mode and the high-speed sync. Uh, and for any of you who are wondering, want to dive deeper into that, maybe, you know, aren't super clear on that, 
and want to get some more info on that, I can tell you JC from Westcott will be back with us uh, May 25th. So that's roughly about a, a month from now, but you can go to the website, you can check it out. It's, it's posted on the website currently, and uh, he's going to be talking about outdoor stroke for beginners. And so questions like that are great to ask to JC because he's got a ton of technical knowledge on that. Uh, he's the Westcott brand rep. So uh, you can definitely bring those questions if you weren't completely clear on that. But uh, Adam, any last parting words you'd like to leave with the audience? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you want to hit me up on Instagram and ask any questions, I'll try and respond to those. Again, it's a gold photo, a gold photo. And then my, I haven't been great about creating educational YouTube videos, but there are some on my YouTube, especially that cat photography one. Um, there's another one with, you know, some Westcott lighting, but they're, you know, they're a little bit older, but still relevant. And then, um, if you're, you know, if you're in the St. Louis area, I'm going to be at Shutterfest, um, in April at actually next week teaching some sessions. So I'm, I'm not sure if you could still register, but maybe next year, um, I'll be at that teaching and then some other places teaching too. But yeah, Instagram is the best place to reach out. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, Adam, want to say thanks again. Again, thanks to Westcott. And most importantly, as always, thanks to everybody at home or, or wherever you're watching. I'm assuming home. I'm home. But if you're if you're in your car or in the office and you're sneaking away from your boss, thanks. Thanks for watching there as well. Uh, this is another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time.